Welcome back. This is topic 10. We're only going to be talking about strong acids and strong bases in this particular video. So um, we'll also be talking about... Can I, can I help you? No, keep going. No, I mean you're you're the one that that walked in here. Like, I'm just I'm just saying like look, do you do you want to like I guess, yeah, I you guess think I you can teach, teach this? I'll let you oh, teach it. I don't. You can fine, teach it if fine. you want. Just, just whatever. Move just go in. ahead. Um, do it. Yeah. Do it. Anyway, um, what do you want to know? Let's start with the pH scale. Um, concentration of H plus, right? So to calculate the pH, you're just looking at concentration of hydronium minus log concentration. Nothing, nothing hard Technically, here. no. We learned that it's the activity that matters. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Um, we're not even supposed to worry about that in this class, right? So that doesn't even count. What does count, though, is that the pH scale goes from, as it's shown in this picture, 0 all the way up to 14. Actually, no, I, I do have to correct you here. So, yeah. <sighs> okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, the pH scale doesn't stop at zero. It doesn't stop at 14 either. So just try this. pH minus log of two molars. Put it in your calculator. You're going to see it's going to be a negative number. So we can go below zero. And in fact, we've even recorded like in the natural environment, pH is below zero. So take this example over here. This is like a volcanic mountain lake. So it's like we're talking about sulfur, making sulfuric acid, things like that. So the pH in this lake... Uh, has been as low as 0 0.5, which is like extremely low. To calculate the equivalent H plus concentration, 3.2 molar, like really, really concentrated. But that's not nearly as low as it's gone. There's like a mine here. This is an iron mine that's been active for years and years in California. The pH of some of the water went in there was recorded at minus 3.6. Now, to do the calculation there, we're talking about an H plus concentration of 4,000 molar, which is like, obviously that's not the actual concentration. We are talking about activity, so it's more like the effective concentration to do with ionic yeah, strength. Four, than it, I mean, that's, that's, that doesn't even make sense. Anyway, so like, anyway maybe, yeah, yeah. but whatever. So one thing that should make sense is the pH when it's neutral. So neutral means that the concentration of H plus and OH will be equal. And when we're talking about water, that happens when the concentrations are 10 to the minus 7, and that means you can calculate the pH. pH will be 7. So another way of saying that is that when your pH is not 7, your sample is not neutral. No, that's not true either. Oh, come on. I'll prove it. Fine, okay, fine, fine. so pH 7 does mean that the concentration of H plus equals the concentration of OH minus. But that's for water at a very specific uh, temperature, 25 degrees. So let's explain why that happens. So we see that the H plus and OH minus concentration depends on the autoprotolysis of water. So we basically see water dissociating here into one molecule of H3O plus and another one of OH minus when two molecules of water collide. Now the Kw, the equilibrium constant for water, is 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees Celsius. So we can use that number to calculate the concentration of H plus but the Kw changes. So if we look at boiling water here, we see the Kw goes up 51 times 10 to the minus 14. Doesn't seem like much of a big difference, but if we take that number and we solve for the concentration of H+, plus, we know H plus and OH are equal, so they both be equal to X, and we just have to take the square root of the Kw. That's strictly speaking what the pH of a neutral solvent would be, square root of Kw. So what does that work out to be? Well, in this case, the pH is 6.1. And I know what you're thinking, the water's acidic. No, it's, so it's not boiling acidic. water is it's, acidic, it's acidic neutral. Then? Yeah, neutral. It's like okay, equal concentration. Okay. Yeah, I um, guess I didn't know that. Okay, we're talking about strong acids now. So the most definitive feature of a strong acid is that it dissociates completely in water. So that means if you have like HCl, one of the strong acids, you plop it in some water, all of it will yeah. disappear. Oh. And there's only a few I'm just, that... I'm just gonna get really technical here. We always say that strong acids dissociate completely in water. That isn't completely true. We should be saying that they dissociate almost completely. So if you look on the table here, you'll notice that you can actually look up pKa values or Ka values 
for strong acids. Or in other words, it means that there has to be a little bit of the undissociated acid left over in solution. So how much are we talking about? Well, let's, let's take a look at what's going on here. All right, let's just imagine here we've got a molecule of HCl and it's floating around in some water. And of course, there will be a proton transfer reaction, so this is what we're expecting to see. And we're also expecting that this will happen all the time. So it doesn't matter how many molecules we have, no matter how hard you look, you'll never find HCl in there. Always H3O plus and dissociated Cl minus. Well, not really. Uh, because of the Ka or the pKa value, the ratio works out to be about one in a thousand. So there is a little bit of undissociated, undissociated HCl. Not enough to make a difference, but just to point it out. Now, how does that compare to a weak acid? Well, let's deal with HF, hydrofluoric acid, for example, which is a weak acid. It will transfer, transfer its proton to water, make H3O plus. And well, okay, I'm not gonna get into the specific details on it, but just dealing with the pKa, the opposite occurs. In other words, there is more HF that still contains the proton than there is that doesn't. You'd have to look pretty hard to find uh, the fluoride ion by itself, um, a ratio of about one in 256. So most of it is still bound to Oh, I'll take over from this one. Yeah, when we're talking about HF, this is like a dangerous acid to think about. I mean, this thing will eat through pretty much everything. It eats through metal. You can't even put it in a glass container. It'll go right through the container. And don't even think about getting this stuff on your body because if you do, well, your skin will dissolve, your bones will dissolve, you'll just disappear, you'll turn into a big blobby mess. We've seen it on TV, right? I mean, yeah, you, you do see it on TV, but of course we know that TV likes to stretch the truth a little bit. Acids can eat through organic matter, there's no question about that. HF might not be the best one to do it though. So it is true that HF can't be contained in a glass container. In fact, that's one of the most common uses of HF as an etching agent. So you see this glass wafer over here, all these, these little micro imprintments were done by using HF and exposing it to the glass, which eats right through it. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, it isn't as, or maybe fortunately, I guess, it isn't as strong as, as what people would think it is in the sense that if you put a, a metal or, or, or some organic matter into HF, it doesn't just disappear on you instantly. There was a, a Mythbusters episode that, that looked into this. So you're looking at different materials that were exposed to the HF concentrated overnight. It, it did a good job on the gyp rock, on the, on the drywall, but the metal, the wood ba barely got touched in it overall. The, the, the ceramic, yeah, a little bit was eaten off, but that's a piece of pork flesh in there and, and that nothing happened to it. Um, don't get me wrong here. So like, yes, HF is extremely dangerous in terms of handling it in the laboratory. If you do get it on you, it's not the trouble of it dissolving your skin. It's in fact kind of worse than that. So HF contact, what it does is, is uh, you won't feel it to begin with. So it's, it does a very deep tissue damage. It destroys the nerves before you even realize it. So by the time it hurts, it's kind of too late. What's really bad about it though, is that the fluoride ion will, will uh, sequester calcium. And we mentioned in a previous video that calcium floats around in our blood. It's important for, um, for the beating of our heart. So if you suck up too much HF into your bloodstream, then it's going to cause really big d damage to, to your heart. And uh, you'll have to do something about it right away. So chemists that work with HF in the lab, they do have to have the appropriate safety training. They definitely have to have this chemical here, calcium gluconate on hand as a way of kind of trying to eliminate some of the fluoride if it ever did happen. This isn't something that I personally work with in my lab, so I don't have direct experience to it, but I do know that it's kind of a nasty one. All right, so let's just continue the discussion dealing with KAs and PKAs. So we're talking about weak acids now, actually. So with a weak acid, you could describe an equilibrium here, which means that there will always be a little bit of everything on each side of the, re of the reaction. HA doesn't disappear to zero. Of course, the stronger the acid, the smaller it gets. So if we think about how that affects the magnitude of Ka, when the denominator is small, the Ka value is large. We can also talk about a pKa. So pKa is just minus log of the Ka expression. And once again, if the HA concentration is small, or in other words, if most of it is associated, 
then the pKa will tend towards zero, or in the extreme cases, like for a strong acid, the, K, the pKa can actually go onto the, the negative side. Right, so pKa is useful for weak acids. Uh, but for strong acids, I mean, we're basically, you agree, we're, we're gonna say that they dissociate completely. Sure. Good enough? Good. Yeah. Okay. So, in terms of the strong acids, we are gonna say that they dissociate completely. There are not that many to think about. There's like only six in the whole world. Nope. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot more than six strong acids. Uh, these are the common ones that we list, but there are several more than that. So if we're talking about like how strong we can go, um, this compound here, trific acid, pKa minus 15, pretty strong. Um, not the strongest one, carburane acid. So this is like uh, this boron cluster uh, that's actually sort of permanently negative charge, let's say, pKa minus 20. Now, in case you're wondering, the, the record for the strongest acid where you can't even define the pKa is, believe it or not, hydrofluoric acid, but not HF dissolved in water. This is HF in a different solvent. So the solvent here is a, a pentafluoro uh, antimonic acid. So it's, yeah, it's a weird system. This thing is like, the only way you can store it is in a Teflon container. Can I, can I do this last thing? Please? Okay. I'm being told that for the strong bases, we only need to worry about the group one and the group two, your, your sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, and then yeah, the metal hydride. Is that, is that good? Am, am I okay here? No, that's fine. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I finally got something right. Okay, we're, we're at the end, so um, yeah, thank you for uh, coming out and helping with the video. Let's just do a quick summary of what we learned today. So yeah, we are gonna say that strong acids dissociate completely, close enough. That's right, yeah. So that means that the concentration of H plus will be equal to the concentration of our strong exactly. acid. And yeah, pH minus yeah. log concentration of H3O plus. Are we good? Yeah. Are we good, everybody? Okay. Right on, good stuff, see you later.